I, I came across the story of a brilliant young preacher who accepted the call of a, a large church to become its minister. And the people generally were, were pleased with his storing, stirring oratory and his fine scholarship. But there still seemed to be something missing in his sermons. And, and one Sunday morning, there was a, a note on the pulpit from one of his elders. And it contained a, a Bible's verse from John's Gospel, chapter 12 and verse 21 in the King James Version. And it said this, Sir, we would see Jesus. And it sort of gnawed away at the young minister. It bothered him. It troubled him. The Holy Spirit was convicting him. It wasn't about him and him showcasing his giftedness. It was about, in Paul's words to the Corinthians that actually Susie quoted to us, resolving to know nothing while he was among them except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So this young man really wrestled with the Lord in prayer. And he finally gave up on his scholarly lectures. And he became a real ambassador of the living Lord Jesus. As he preached, he pleaded with people to be reconciled with God through Jesus Christ, God's son. Some of the congregation who had come to be dazzled by his public speaking, they actually stayed in church and they began to pray and to confess their sins. A great change then had come over the preacher and his congregation. On a later subsequent Sunday morning, there was another note on the pulpit. This time it was a verse from John's Gospel, chapter 20 and verse 20, also from the King James Version, and it read, Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. I was wondering on what text to preach on this morning. And I was really, I came upon this same verse from John's Gospel from chapter 20, and I was, I was really struck by it. And it's the title that I've given to this Easter Sunday morning sermon. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. You know, John chapter 20 is full of raw human emotions. First of all, you, you have the, the grief of Mary Magdalene in verses 11 to 13. And her grief is best summed up by the reply that she gives to the two angels who ask her why she's crying. And she sobs. They've taken my Lord away and I don't know where they have put him. You have the, the doubt of Thomas in verse 25. He simply cannot bring himself to believe that the testimony of his fellow disciples is credible. And he reacts to the, the seeing the Lord with extreme scepticism. Crucified men do not come back from the dead. The Romans are simply too efficient at carrying out this grisly task. What his fellow disciples have claimed to have seen was fanciful. And he gives them his own preconditions for believing their tall story. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And then in this morning's passage, you have the state of mind of Jesus's by then, ten disciples in the absence of Thomas and on account of the suicide of Judas. And I'd like us just to spend a few moments considering how their, their frame of mind was dramatically transformed over the course of just two verses. And firstly, we see in, in verse 19, their feeling of fear. Their feeling of fear. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. 
The Greek word translated as fear is phobos, phobos, from whence we get our word in English, phobia, phobia. I expect all of us have had the experience of calling to see someone first thing in the morning and you're standing outside their front door after ringing the doorbell. And then you hear a multiplicity of locks and chains being unfastened to let you in. People naturally lock doors, don't they, to keep unwanted visitors out. People lock doors for the fear of being broken into. Therefore, locked doors and fear make for bedfellows. Mary Magdalene's testimony that she had seen the risen Lord hadn't helped the disciples overcome their fear. No doubt they didn't quite know what to make of what she had told them. Was it just the, the hallucination of a devoted follower of Christ who desperately wanted to see Jesus again and who could not accept the bitter reality of his death? Was Mary's testimony at all to be taken seriously? Was it all just, dare I say it, a woman's histrionics? And it's now some 12 to 14 hours later. It's evening and Jesus has not made any further appearances. Verse 8 recalls John going into the tomb and seeing it empty and believing. But then verse 9 qualifies this statement with, they still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Therefore, quite what John believed, we cannot be certain of. So here are the ten disciples behind locked doors, confused, not knowing quite what to believe. They're feeling lost in a city far from their home in Galilee. They're feeling lonely in a city with a lot of hostility towards their master. And without Jesus, they are feeling leaderless. And they're feeling fearful. Jesus had made a lot of powerful enemies and he was a dangerous man to be associated with. They were feeling jittery. They were on edge. Every knock on the door from the outside world un unnerved them. Might it be the Jewish religious lead leaders' heavies come to arrest them? They intended to lie as low as possible until all the hullabaloo over Jesus had died down and they could slip quietly back to the obscurity of Galilee and presumably take up their previous professions. John Howard draws attention to the locked doors, not just to emphasize the disciples' fear, but to draw attention to the miracle which was about to unfold. Suddenly, the risen Lord Jesus is in their midst. Even locked doors cannot keep out a risen Lord. One moment he isn't there, the next he is. He arrives in the room, standing among them, and in part, secondly, the greeting of peace, verse 19. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. You know, the peace Jesus greeted his startled disciples with should be understood in two ways. Firstly, it was peace with God. Peace with God. They had nothing to fear from Jesus. Yes, they, they had been faithless. Yes, they had fled when Jesus had been arrested. Yes, Peter had thrice denied even knowing this Jesus of Nazareth, despite Peter's accent giving him away that he was a Galilean himself. Yes, they were scared out of their wits that they might meet the same fate as their master, death on a Roman cross. But Jesus does not greet them with a reprimand but with this reassuring word, peace. J.C. Ryle writes this, peace not blame, peace not fault finding, peace not rebuke was the first word which this little company heard from their master's lips after he left the tomb. When Jesus showed them his pierced hands and sighed, these wounds meant more than him merely identifying himself. 
They were also evidence that the price for salvation had been paid and that these flawed men were beneficiaries of peace with God. In the words of the, the prophet Isaiah, Jesus was demonstrating to them that he had been pierced for their transgressions. He had been crushed for their iniquities. The punishment that had brought them peace was on him. By Jesus' wounds, they had been healed. The risen Lord was none other than the crucified sacrifice for their sin. In Paul's words to the Romans, he had been delivered over to death for their sins and had been raised to life for their justification. So when Jesus said, peace be with you, this was peace with God. Despite their sin, they were righteous in God's sight. But secondly, this, this greeting of peace uh, whereby it's also imparting the peace of God, the peace of God. The familiar Hebrew greeting of Shalom, peace be with you, has a far richer and deeper meaning than just the absence of stress and worry. No, Shalom in that the context of the Bible means well-being in its fullest sense. Shalom invokes the idea of all the accumulating blessings of the kingdom of God. Shalom is life at its best under the gracious hand of the covenant God of Israel. And Jesus' first word of shalom to his disciples then on that first Easter Sunday evening is the natural outcome of his last words on the first Good Friday. Shalom is the consequence of tetelestai. Peace be with you in the room with locked doors is the complement of it is finished on the cross. As the work of redemption had been completed on the cross by Jesus' death, not only reconciliation, peace with God had been accomplished, but also life from God in all its fullness had been given. It was just as Jesus had promised his disciples, I have come that you might have life, life in all its fullness. You know, to, to have peace about a matter is to have an awareness of adequate resources to handle that matter. You may have an exorbitant energy bill to pay but you can sleep soundly in your bed at night as you know that you have sufficient money in the bank to settle the account this jesus was saying to his disciples shalom be at peace in me you have everything you need and more to get through a life of serving me the peace of god and see how uh, Jesus repeats this greeting in verse 21. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. And then he goes on to commission the disciples for mission. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Jesus' greeting of shalom encompasses the peace of God. God's abundant resources for a lifetime of service and mission. The feeling of fear, the greeting of peace, and then thirdly we have the disciples, verse 20, sense of joy. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Outwardly, that their circumstances were just the same as they had been prior to Jesus appearing to them. As the disciples of the crucified Jesus of Nazareth, they were persons of interest to the Jewish religious leaders. As disciples of this self-appointed teacher from Galilee, they were the obvious people next in line for the Jewish religious leaders to make an example of. Their position, therefore, remained precarious. But the atmosphere in the room had been transformed at a stroke. Fear had given way to joy. 
Dread had been overtaken by the light, and it was all down to this. Jesus had transformed their feeling of fear into a sense of joy by coming to them. Disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. It was the presence of the Lord which made all the difference, all the difference in the world. Now everything added up. Mary's testimony was true. She had seen the Lord. And now Mary's testimony was their testimony. The disciples had seen the Lord as well. It was exactly the same testimony she had given to them that they gave to Thomas in verse 25. We have seen the Lord. They had seen his pierced hands. They had seen his side lanced by a Roman sphere. What they saw, however, was not a dead body, but a living Lord. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. You know, this should be our prayer for one another, for the overflowing joy which comes from seeing the Lord Jesus through the lens of faith. How do we see the Lord? How do we see the Lord? Well, through the pages of his written word, in our own private devotions. When a verse lips out of the text, we're reading and impresses itself in our minds. When the accompanying notes of the material we use in our own personal Bible reading really helps us grasp what the passage is saying. We see the Lord through the systematic public preaching of God's word, Sunday by Sunday, and thereby begin to grasp more of God's big picture for the salvation of his people. You know, Thomas's initial absence meant that he missed out on seeing the Lord, didn't he? It brings home to us the importance of being regularly in church, sitting under the ministry of God's word. We see the Lord through God's providence, through his overruling of our circumstances to put us in the place he intends us to be. Keith Johns, the retired pastor of Caterham Baptist Church, is preaching for us tonight. I was speaking to him earlier in the week and he said how he and Pauline have now moved away from Caterham. On account of Keith's close links with Grace Baptist Mission, they had intended to move to Abingdon in Oxfordshire where the offices of GBM are located. But the purchase of the house they had hoped to buy in Abingdon fell through when the, decide, the, the owners decided not to sell. So Keith and Pauline had a rethink and instead looked at moving to Reading where they had family. So they have recently moved to a small town outside of Reading, Woodley, if you know it. Shortly after they moved in, the family next door called in with some flowers to welcome them as their new neighbours. Keith and Pauline invited them in and they got talking and it struck them that there was something different about this family. The parents mentioned that they were homeschooling their four children. And so Keith, put his head above the parapet and asked, are you Christians? Are you Christians? Yes, indeed, they were God's overruling. Keith and Pauline had moved next door to a Christian family, but it didn't stop there. I asked, I asked uh, Keith where he and Pauline were going, to, whether he and Pauline were going to go to Carey Baptist Church in Reading, the most obvious church to go to with its strong evangelical reputation. Unbeknown to Keith, under, um, said that Carey Baptist Church happened to be about to embark on a church planting project. Can you guess where? In Woodley, in Woodley, where he and Pauline have just move to. And as a consequence, one of the pastors at Carey has arranged to meet with Keith and Pauline to discuss them getting involved with the church plant. We see the Lord's in his providential dealings with us, ordering and overruling the circumstances of our lives. And when we do, it causes us, doesn't it, to rejoice. 
But lastly, we see the Lord in the lives of our fellow Christians, in the, in the faith in God that they cling on to when life is really tough, in the practical kindness that they show towards others, in the patient way that they react to different people, in their words of encouragement and counsel, in their meekness and humility, in their thoughtfulness and courtesy, in their faithfulness and reliability. The genuine Christian is always overjoyed when he or she sees clear evidence of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ in another Christian. He should have no greater pleasure than saying, I can see Christ in you. Chapter 20 then is full, isn't it, of raw human emotions, which are completely turned on their head. Mary's grief is turned to, into exhideration. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. Thomas's doubt is turned into faith. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. And the disciples fear it into joy. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Jesus addressed the disciples' fear of men by his presence. He came to them just as he said he would do a few days earlier. John 16 and verse 22 says this, But I will see you again and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. And Jesus also addressed his disciples' fear by his peace. He came to assure them that they had peace with God as he showed them his wounded hands and side and that they had the peace and resources of God as he commissioned them to carry on his work. The disciples' joy came from seeing the Lord. Well, may God give us the eyes to consistently see the risen Lord Jesus as we navigate through the waters of the life of faith. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Amen.